I believe that we need to understand how to code because it's almost as important as learning how to read and write in the technology we live in nowadays. Episode 105. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with Nicholas Darby, the Managing Director of Imagine Architects in South Africa and the founder of Sky Boardroom, an innovative platform supporting office owners in renting out their commercial letting space. Now, I began conversations with Nicholas at the beginning of the year and was excited to hear of his journey into software architecture and coding and how he was merging this with his his traditional practice of architecture. Now, Nicholas is exploring the possibilities of artificial intelligence in building ecosystems, construction, as well as post-occupancy analysis. So in this podcast, Nicholas describes the evolution of his career and how he views the importance of technological literacy in the industry becoming revolutionized architects for the 22nd century. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Nicholas Darby. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business, and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call, just simply to find out how our content has been of value. And if we get that far and with your permission, of course, what might be next, what what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Nick, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show. How are you? Thank you. Thanks very much. No, I'm well. And uh, you are in South Africa, whereabouts exactly? Um, I'm currently in um, Johannesburg, um, which is sort of the northeastern part of uh, South Africa. Brilliant. And you are an architect and you've got a, an interest and you've been doing a lot of research into artificial intelligence in architecture. You're the founder of Imagine Architects and you're also a, a programmer. Well, um, a, a, a pro- program uh, starter or coder um, beginner, I think uh, it's um, this sort of COVID-19 um, lockdown has been a process where um, it's, it's sort of, um, which you were saying the other day, it's sort of, but similar to the nudge theory, um, the lockdown pushed me into getting into the process of learning coding um, and uh, something that my practice has always uh, been looking into at the sort of 11 week lockdown we had in South Africa, I literally put pen to paper, did my Python courses and started looking into the software integration into, into the profession, which is, which is very exciting and uh, obviously very keen to talk about with yourself. Amazing. So tell, tell me a little bit about your, your practice and how your career has started to evolve into, because I know that you've, um, you've, you've had forays into software before. So the, the, my my software experience has typically been um, in uh, jumping from MicroStation to Autodesk Rivet, AutoCAD, ArchiCAD, and I think as as a lot of architects in uh, my age, early forties, probably can relate uh, how moving from firm to firm, the uh, software um, jumping has has changed quite a lot, um, but. I literally uh, am jumping more into the coding as well. Um, well, look, looking into um, how coding can be integrated into architecture. And during this whole period, I looked into uh, C++, uh, C Sharp, JavaScript, Java, um, Python, um, and and just got a sort of an idea uh, as to what they're they're all about and 
restructured my mindset from being an architectural designer or building designer into a coding designer. Um, mm. Interestingly, how they're so similarly related because there's a structure to it. And uh, basically came to the conclusion that Python was the type of software program that, that uh, I needed to go with my practice. Um, so just to answer your your, your question, backtracking a bit, um, I've um, I worked in London for a very long time, um, just over ten years. Um, so I had a lot of corporate uh, commercial design experience. Yeah. Um, worked with um, some really uh, amazingly talented architects. Uh, worked at Hamilton's Architects um, al alongside the likes of Ian Bogle and Robin Partington. I think uh, my whole uh, building design experience with those two guys um, were uh, groundbreaking um, and really learned uh, a fascinating process of, of how to um, approach building de uh, design and uh, going through so many different options um, and leading um, the client through the design process and covering so many different options for design context. And, uh, Understanding um, exactly what it means to uh, to to really design a building in in the in, in the UK context. Mm -hmm. um, following that, I um, opened my own practice, and uh, I've been going now for about ten years. Um, I do specialise predominantly in exclusive homes, um, and I do do small scale commercial buildings. Um, but what I found in my experience in in my career is that uh, I do feel I do. I do think it's a bit um, maybe a little bit stuck in, a, in an old paradigm. Um, I think the architectural era that I came from was sort of sitting in an office with a plaque on the wall and clients came to you, asked you to design buildings. Nowadays, I'm more an entrepreneur. I have to go out to find work. Yeah. Um, and I think in my South African context, um, it's very, uh, the culture, the business culture here is very entrepreneurial driven because of socio-political issues, um, which is all, all fun really, um, and exciting. So there's opportunities for law here. Um, and what I've, what I've seemed to have learned, um, pre COVID-19 as well was how, um, I needed to look into automating a lot of my business because, it presents an opportunity first 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 and foremost um i was discussing um existing commercial buildings with giant landlords such as redefine and growth point um and just acknowledging how i could improve their um commercial buildings to dramatically save a substantial amount of money every month and mm. i looked at how to modify their existing commercial buildings in terms of energy and energy efficiency, space efficiency. Um, and this started going down the road of um, integrating a software platform or a software as a service um, to these landlords where I can take a few steps back, look at how the building can be redesigned with modifications, um, introduce sensors into the building with the internet of things, um, and then create a software platform where the, the building will start to manage itself so we were looking at dramatic savings in, in lighting, um, uh, energy use throughout the course of the day, solar control, um, aircon efficiencies. Um, and we were looking at it with a sort of 15 to 20 story building in the middle of Johannesburg with these kinds of cost efficiencies that I introduced with the software platform. We were looking at 150 to 200,000 Rand a month savings. So, you know, that, that kick started the process. Then um, COVID-19 happened mm. um, and uh, I suddenly, um, I had my other interests in, in AI um, and with my in-depth uh, research and literally coding learning of Python, I, I realized how, how integrated it is in Pinterest, Facebook, Instagram, Netflix especially, um, where there, there's, a, there's a machine learning um, tactic within these software platforms that encourage the AI that make it obviously a dramatically user-friendly um, app. Um, so I've looked into introducing that, that, that artificial intelligence and machine learning into the earlier design um, process, purely on the basis that after learning about how these commercial buildings needed to change to get that energy efficiency, uh, it, it stands to common sense that it would be great to put these intuitive 
um, well, these insights rather um, into the design process. Mm. And by doing that, um, I can look into introducing machine learning um, within within that cycle. Much so when, the same way. So sorry to interrupt. But when you say machine learning or artificial artificial intelligence, how are you defining that? So they, um, without getting too much, uh, without getting into too much detail, because I won't uh, profess myself to be um, that artificial, artificially intelligent um, in in knowledge and research, because it's taking. I'm still jumping into it, but right. there is that the, the machine learning is um, teaching the computer to recognize patterns um, and to instigate a process of algorith- algorithms because of the um, awareness of those patterns. Artificial intelligence is is more of a deeper learning. It starts to introduce neural ne- neural networks and and uh, it integrates a whole host of networks together on a weighted system that's very similarly related to the neurons in our brain. Um, and and uh, you know where you get deep learning, which is even more um, uh, in- intelligent. Um, and there are. Um, I would be lying if I told you I knew exactly the ins and outs of what artificial intelligence actually entailed. I think for the for my application plugin, I need to understand the gist of what it can do, um, and and I'm literally literally looking into that now, um, teaching myself Python and applying the coding to this process. But to give an example, um, that um, graphic recognition. Artificial intelligence, so to speak, is more machine learning where you are, um, say, for example, a Labrador, um, you feed the computer thousands upon thousands of images um, so that the computer understands that something with four legs, um, specific type of color, long ears, nose, etc., it's a Labrador, but you also got to teach it that, you know, there could be a picture of a Labrador from the top. You won't see four legs, but at the, you know, you've got to teach the computer that it still is a Labrador. Oh, so there are some complexities with yeah. it. Yeah. But where I've seen the opportunity here is um, I would be applying that same technique to the design process um, and teaching a computer to identify the most not only profitable but most functional and beautiful solution to a site and context. Um, and the only way to do this is in, in a similar fashion to uploading thousands upon thousands of pictures of Labradors, um, teaching the computer some of the most successful buildings that have been designed in the past, certain kind of floor plan layouts that would suit a certain context. Um, and by feeding that all in, um, which, which is quite a, an, an in-depth process um, in, in application of Python as well, yeah. we'll get to a point where we'll have a machine learning technique where we will be able to punch in the site location um, with with an intended function and use, and the computer will spit out um, a artificial intelligent solved um, algorithm algorithm design solution that was dictated by an architect. And uh, if I can elaborate a little bit more between yeah. the two architects, you've got software architects and building architects, and uh, I. As much as they are worlds apart, they're actually very similar. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, I am looking into um, reinventing myself as a, as a software architect, as much as a building architect, and looking how they can feed each other. Because when we look into this, when as we are looking into the software platform at the moment in teaching buildings to um, sustain themselves efficiently, you've got um, a degree of software that has to be well understood from a coding perspective that is an application towards what the building architect was looking at for a solution so if you are going to introduce software uh, sensors in the building um aircon control that is sort of cooler during warm days and warmer during cold days and all that kind of thing Mm. You've got to have a building architect mindset to understand how the coding is intended to work so that you can produce these energy efficient results. And so you can quite clearly see how there's a, a fascinating syncing of um, software technology, even lit- syntax coding and integrating that into um, the building design process. Mm. So uh, identifying those al- algorithms is is a very exciting um 
adventure. Uh, I think it's it's the way that the profession needs to go. And just sort of plugging back into where I said that architects were maybe a little bit more of an older paradigm. Um, I feel that the profession hasn't really caught up or kept up to speed with reality. And uh, this is a this is really the opportunity where we can literally kickstart and launch the, the profession into where it needs to be. Mm. Because with these types of technologies at hand, it almost doesn't make sense for us not to be making use of it. And and there's no point redesigning a building yourself when you know that there are 20,000 floor plans that have been amazingly designed. We need to plug that in and integrate that um, with, with our own uh, design sense as well. So you'll have that machine learning artificial intelligence application which is monitored by the architect uh, myself. So, so in, in terms of what exists at the moment, um, in terms of like intelligent computational design, not, 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 this is different from parametric design, obviously. Um, we're, talking about, yes. or, we're, we're talking about something that's, you know, you're able to set a, a set of parameters, if you like, or input data about the site, and then the design is completely generated yes es- essentially um, what, what what exists at the moment in terms of being able to do that um i um unless it's uh you know i've i'm still in the process of of doing the research of what's been done uh, in the past but i'm i'm not at this point in time I, i'm aware that there are um individuals um, in Russia and in Australia, who are applying this process now, but um, not entirely sure if it's actually being used uh, as a commercial um, incentive. Right. But it's uh, certainly in South Africa. There's uh, there's uh, no one's really making use of it. It's uh, it's a little, little ahead of uh, its time in in this country, but it certainly uh, got very ripe for opportunity to doing something like this. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so there's there's two sort of branches that I'm hearing here. One is the kind of the understanding the occupancy and the usage of the building and being able to collect data like that. And then there's the other end of it, which is at the in the design process itself. Yes, that's correct. Um, and so it's almost pre and post building completion. Got it. And uh, I, I think at the moment there are i mean this introduction of artificial technology into buildings um is what they probably coin smart buildings has been going for about 15 20 years i believe uh, you know simply the introduction of sensors the internet of things um and teaching the building to make itself efficient um that we're aware of and i, I believe that some of the first world countries um around the globe are already making use of this. Um, where I've seen it being applied to the design process, I think it's less so. Mm. Um, and, and that's very much up for debate in some cases. But um, what's fascinating about this process though, and which is quite a conclusion for me, is that there, there are some debates in how this will uh, make the architect obsolete where there's an introduction of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and, and we'll be looking towards um, the, those spectrums in order to punch out or churn out uh, buildings. And uh, and I can see that there are some individuals out there that are proclaiming that this could potentially see the, see the end um, of architects. But I have uh, put a, a fair amount of research into that very point. Um, and uh, I can answer that now if you want, or I can leave go, it. Yeah, no, go for, go, go for it. What, what, <laughs> what, is, what is your speculation about the future of, of the architect and are we so, at risk of becoming obsolete and replaced by computers? I think it's. Uh, I think you're you're asking that as a very pertinent one, um, especially going into this process so um, in depth with my time. I wanted to obviously identify a solution here, and and it all comes about from um, a story which was written by um, a author by the name of David Epstein in the book Range, which is a recent publication published in May 2019. And he talks about um, this Gary Kasper- Kasparov story. Um, and basically, the summary of the story is that um, can computers take over human beings, uh, in other words, artificial intelligence, 
speaking over mankind. Now, um, this whole uh, application in the design process is um, similarly related to one of uh, his stories uh, that the that the author talks about. And uh, what what he elaborates on is that there's uh, is a famous chess player uh, called Gary Kasparov, um, and he looks to um, beat a supercomputer. Um, and 1997, there's a showdown, final battle for supremacy between natural and artificial intelligence. IBM supercomputer Deep Blue defeats Gary Kasparov. Um, and that's very, um, very amazing, obviously, for the AI world um, to see that a, a computer can actually beat the world's best chess player. Mm. So this obviously got to um, Gary Kasparov, um, and he looked into it um, for for quite a period of time. Um, and he also introduced the idea to integrate with computers um, in order to beat the computer. Um, so what, what was so fascinating about um, that conclusion was that human beings will always have that bigger picture mentality um, or strategy when it comes to problem solving. Um, when he looked into uh, Deep Blue, identifying you know up to 20 million solutions on each chess move chess piece move it was it was simply um a teaching of uh well machine learning teaching of all the different moves that the computer can do mm. but what that what that machine learning lacked was that um bigger picture or um human brain strategy um that could pick that out so what he did was um he ultimately um beat the computer by integrating himself with another computer that he outsourced for the um, different options to beat uh, this deep blue. And in the end, um, the conclusion is that uh, the, the, the human brain comes up tops because we, as much as we um, appreciate that computers and human beings can support each other with differing strengths and weaknesses mm. when it comes to combining human brain and artificial intelligence against artificial intelligence, the human brain and, and IT works. So that's, uh, that's really um, a tremendous um, pivotal moment for me in my conclusions to looking into these um, new technologies and whether or not they'll uh, you know supersede us as architects or not. I think it's very much the case that that that's, uh, is unlikely, unlikely to happen um, mm -hmm. because we've got the, the bigger picture mentality, uh, we've got the strategic thinking power, um, but it goes even further than that, um, and that is that I don't believe that machine learning or, or even AI for that matter can have a, um, a spiritual sense now, often uh, as an architect, and I'm sure you being an architect as well, um, you get to a point where you are um, looking at, at that design resolve for spiritual upliftment, be it um, the use inside the building or literally just driving past one. And that th therein lies uh, an even bigger challenge to, to get algorithms for that. Um, I mean, I can sit down and, and uh, dominate control over the algorithms that will create this um, AI uh, design of buildings, um, but it will it, it, it will never be able to um, incorporate that that spiritual decision making, um, mm. uh, in, in, in which is obviously inherent in being a human being. Well, it's just interesting what you say actually about about the, the sort of limitations of the computer and how uh, Gary Kasparov kind of you know, learned to merge himself, if you like, with another computer in order to beat the computer. And obviously with our, with architect architecture, we are dealing with complexity. And that book you mentioned there with, uh, by um, Epstein is, is brilliant because it kind of talks about actually how some of the most successful breakthroughs in human civilization has come about from the linking of very um, disparate subjects and topic manners and actually the human brain you know are we can go off and you know we can be playing baseball or something or dancing and then we can bring what we've learned from that area um, maybe not even intentionally but it kind of comes through into another area like thinking about physics or thinking about electrons or something like that and actually you know it, the human brain is is quite magnificent in the way that it can connect and have overarching views views of things and obviously that's what we do as architects i mean i've I spoken to uh, um tom yeah. Kindig springs to mind about how he was saying 
one of the most important things for an architect to do is to do things that are outside of architecture because yeah. this, this makes architecture rich. And he was saying for him, you know, skiing was always the, you know, the, 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 the thing that kind of allows his brain to, to be released and to, you know, the kind of nurturing in that kind of sense. But actually there was something about learning about the landscape through skiing that actually informed the buildings that he produces in those kinds of magnificent landscapes. And that's something obviously that a computer, unless, unless a human being tells the computer to, to start joining those things up is difficult for a computer to, to, to do it by itself. That's what I'm, what I'm that's also uh, that's ultimately um, the main point. Yes, uh, and and how it can't exist without without the architect. So it's almost imperative that the architect understands the software in order to apply the the hardware, so to speak, or the building mm. um, design. Mm. Um, similarly, uh, I, I think what you're saying in terms of the range from that book and and the range of skill is absolutely fascinating. Because um, look at Steve Jobs when he went into that calligraphy class and how mm. that was such a pivotal um, design element of of his um, hardware products. Absolutely amazing. And and here here is a complete pure application of the similar fashion where I have um, looked at the opportunities of Python software and Python. Mm coding um, and where that's led my practice and and where we are looking to integrate a, an AI process in the not just the completion of the building but in the early stages and the access with that is is tremendous because uh, we well, I'm obviously looking at it as, as as an asset towards asset for my firm because what would normally take three or four weeks of the building design process would probably take a matter of a few nanoseconds now um, with the correct application of these uh, algorithms. Um, in order to generate this um, building footprint with your AI uh, in, information, so it, it it really is fascinating how you know obviously spreading your skill and looking into other areas and bringing it into um, our career is is a very exciting one. Um, but I I have to admit, as an architect, that that we do have that. I think we're more inclined to have that skill. You know, we we are able to you know design in absolute detail and then take. 20 steps back and look at the big picture. Yeah. It, it, it really has a, a, been an enjoyable skill um, from the early days of, of learning to be an architect to in getting into our 40s now and understanding how to find that skill and seeing how it can be made a, a lucrative asset. How, how important <laughs> do you think um, open source an open source culture will be in architecture in the future. So obviously like in, in the world of coding and programming, there's this wonderful culture of just sharing the, you know, your code and people kind of cut and paste stuff and hack things together. And, you know, solutions are out in the open for you to go and get. And it's, it's meant that the evolution of software has, has increased very rapidly because of that kind of sharing culture architecture we don't do that so much we're often as you say we're often d designing from the beginning every single time whereas an artificial intelligence allows us to um integrate lots of other solutions yes yeah, so what are your thoughts on on open source culture in architecture i i think uh, yeah it's interesting how you've uh, jumped onto that that um concept because i think it's going to be um very predominant in the future of the profession, um, not just with the fact that COVID-19 has, has played a role with the social distancing and a lot of uh, um, resources being based in, anywhere in the world, but also from um, the integration into software, it's going to become um, a lot more uh, coding based. Um, and it, it, it needs to demonstrate the way to go because, you know, what I've, one of the things I've learned as an architect is understanding how not to reinvent the wheel all the time, mm. which we have mm. such a great habit of doing because we love originality. But um, making use of that skill is a massive asset to give you the chance to be able to work on customized design processes. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, in the in the old days, I believe that, uh, you know, we used to look at how to standardize ironmongery schedules. So it would ma be a matter of editing it later. Um, I work for a, um, a, an incredibly talented company called Stefan Anthony, Olmsdal Truen Architects in Cape Town. And they were absolutely adamant about doing that, um, working on automating the process. Um, I'm trying to take it to that, that to, to its its highest 
point where we can perform that whole process with the technology from an AI and ML perspective. It really has to be the way that, the way it's going to, to go. And you know, if you are you know, part of being an architect as well as being a good team leader and mm. um, making use of your good uh, of the correct resources, and so outsourcing those processes is going to be paramount. Um, especially when you've got so many young people coming uh, onto the market, understanding JavaScript, um, C Sharp, C++, and Python, that they would be uh, best utilized um, in, in being outsourced into that um, process. So absolutely imperative that it happens. Um, there aren't a lot of architects that are JavaScript fluent. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a... Um, a new learning curve. But what I, one thing I really learned, which is great to express during these 11 weeks of lockdown as well, and, and keeping myself out of code while I design, uh, try to design beautiful buildings, was the fact that nowadays it's not about understanding how to read and write. I think in the 70s and 80s, we went to school to read and write. Um, now we need to, I, I believe that we need to understand how to code because it's almost as important as learning how to read and write in the technology we live in nowadays. Mm. And to be able to use PHP, um, Flask, Django, create an app on my smartphone to create an integrative technology that would generate an income so that I can live a comfortable life. You know, that's, that, that whole um, process that I've just talked about um, with all those softwares can be integrated into our career and um, with with such a dramatic fashion that it's so exciting. Yes. Um, and and, and uh, other reasons where this automation of AI and ML can can come into play for architects, and that is that because there's not a work, lot of lot, because of the economy um, and its challenges, we are a little bit more isolated. Mm. And so as a result, we can um, use these automotive processes to give us a leg up because, you know, typically a big building requires a team. Um, and now it's going to become more a case of having fewer individuals with the, with the software technology that's going to do it for us. And you can see how everything is going that way uh, at the moment as well. I mean, even issuing construction drawings as PDFs on iPads um, is starting to become old news now. Um, you know, yeah. it's quite, quite a regular occurrence. Um, so it's it's all very exciting. And, you know, if I can shout out uh, to say that there's uh, there's a, a necessity for a software architect and building architect to, to reform into a single profession, title mm. i'd be the first one to wave my flag and say there it is we need to we need to get to work and, and head in that direction so uh, over the last few um months what have you been creating with your new with, whilst you've been learning python and what are the and what are the differences between all these different languages so that I, I initially jumped onto that question initially because i wanted to see what software package was the best to learn and the easiest to learn so that I could accelerate the, uh, the journey um, and integrate it into um, the profession. So I looked at C Sharp, JavaScript, uh, and Python primarily. And uh, without going too much into detail, C Sharp uh, and C++, I believe, are, are some of the older, sort of maybe, maybe the IT person would call more dinosaur software, the original ones. Um, but they're certainly the most detailed in terms of uh, the actionable um, syntax that it wants to create. And they, then, then these um, coding program, programming languages start introducing objects, um, which is a so-called package of, of functionalities integrated in the existing code way. Um, and that was sort of more heading towards um, Python and uh, JavaScript. And, uh, I, I, you know, it, if if there are some some coders or or, or very tech savvy individuals hearing me speak about this, uh, uh, give, give me a, a a little bit of slack because I'm still learning the process. But what is so fascinating uh, about Python though is that Python is a language or a syntax that's very similar to architecture. Um, it's beautifully designed to minimize the amount of um, syntax in the in the functionality of the coding so that it actually looks beautiful. Um, whereas something like JavaScript and C Sharp or C++, there's so much punctuation and, mm. and syntax that, that it, 
it almost becomes complicated to to read. I think once you become a coder, you understand and appreciate um, what it's saying and what it's doing. But um, the uh, the Dutch guys who who designed Python were aware of this, and they've auto they've automated coding within the coding, or uh, that which is why Python is is an out, outsourced software. Um, it's using uh, it's the front end of a back end of coding, so it's a lot simpler. Um, good Python coders will tell you that uh, it's it's you know you could take a 25 line um, sequence of JavaScript coding and summarize it into three lines in Python, and this is one of the other reasons why Python is is so um, exciting to learn because because it's simplified and easy to read, and it also reads as English, which is uh, all the more easier to learn. Um, and it's it's probably one of the reasons why it dominates in um, the coding software for robotics right. and artificial intelligence because it's faster. Um, you know, your coding sequence is so much shorter, so you get speed, um, and and it's easier to read. Um, and so that's probably why it's lead, uh, one of the fashionable leading softwares in in some of the more exciting platforms yeah. like Instagram and Netflix, etc. Um, so. The Python is is uh, a, a, the easiest and fastest to learn, um, and and quite an exciting um, form of syntax to introduce automotive uh, processes in your in your profession. I mean, I've looked at it in detail now enough to say that I'd be able to automate a platform where I can plug in resources and design programs. Um, and even client fees and salary management, um, which would all be completely automated within a within a, a Python backend uh, software. Um, so it sounds after it, looking it, into it, all that. Sorry to interrupt. But it, it it sounds as if then that the languages that are used to um, to generate bits of software are actually becoming more more accessible. Yes. They have, and and not and not only accessible, more simplified for for the users. Right. Um. I think they under they understood why. Well, uh, from my experience, I could see that they have um, that coding is very much evolving on a day to day basis. Mm. I mean, some of the programs like PHP, Django, Flask, some of these programs were only invented in twenty fourteen. They they so it's so recent. Um. And when uh, I, I did uh, during a lockdown as well, I did a computer science uh, course at, at the Harvard online uh, on the Harvard online platform. And um, what I learned in that com computational course was how the the zeros and ones ultimately um, go through the the electronics of the of the computer and and appear on your screen. And and each number and letter and punctuation has got the sequence of zeros and ones, and and that these language, these coding languages are literally just a means of how to communicate with the computer to tell it what to do, um, and how that process is worked from electronics through to the original C plus plus and 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 sort of what looks to be quite complicated scripting syntax, through to where uh, the most fashionable uh, coding nowadays, which is probably Python or JavaScript, um, it would be up for debate. I'm sure with the with the heavily IT coding people, mm. but those two you can quite plainly see have become a very simplified um, way of communicating with a computer, and and that like I said earlier, it's so similarly related similarly related to the design process because I'm sure you're aware, you know we we take on when designing a building we take on a complexity of variables um, and we ultimately arrive at a solution that's just been a simplification process. At least that's certainly how I was taught by Ian Vogel and Robin Partington. Um, you know, and and when they took me through the design process, it was fascinating to watch because I had years of experience, and it was a matter of acknowledging what's around you and what you need to do and simplifying the process completely. That uh, mm. when you arrive at the solution, it's almost hit you in the face and. and uh, well, why didn't you see that in the first place? Yeah. Um, and learning is, is similar uh, in fashion like that. But what's really exciting is that how you can take all this, you know, once you get over the, um, the thinking of coding being some sort of, uh, I think the name code just makes it seem um, scary and, and difficult to learn. But once you actually get over that hurdle and see what it can do and how it can 
integrated and automated process towards um, your career, and in our case, the designing of buildings and the management of it mm. afterwards, it almost again slaps you in the face and says, "Here I am. I can't believe you're not using me yet." <laughs> and I've I've realised that, and I've I've uh, also seen how it it can be quite an asset towards my practice. It's really fascinating because we're kind of what it sounds like as well is that we've kind of gone through this process where technology has enabled, you know, we've kind of gone through this recent in the last 20 years or so where technology has become a big entrepreneurial culture. There's lots of different apps that are yes. being designed for different industries. The construction industry has been one of the slower industries to have software designed for them. Largely, I probably yes. think because of the complexity of, of construction and how difficult it is. Yeah. Um, and it's only been reserved for the sort of the large Skanskas and Da Vinci's of the world where they've got in-house designers, software designers, and you know, to regulate things. But now we're moving yeah. into an era where it's not necessarily that we might have our own software, um, you know, bit that we that we purchase and buy, but actually we're creating in-house software to facilitate our designs and doing things. So there's, there'll be this merge between architect and and software writer, and that we'll be creating our own tools to be facilitating our design in our own ways. Or so there's a much more there's a higher level of customization to the to the software tools that we want to be using because the, the I language. I think that's definitely the way it's going. Fascinating. And, and if we can be the forerunners of it, uh, I'd be all for it. Uh, I mean, we, we're certainly looking into uh, every opportunity we can to, to do that um, and appreciating the value and, and leverage that this, that this software can do for us. Mm. And, you know, one of the, I think, you know, the, the more that we can get involved with software um, developers with us, um, the better. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why it wouldn't have been a bad idea to to do this podcast to introduce where I think we need to be guiding the profession um, and is um, perhaps encouraging it towards the likes of Autodesk and Bentley and, and say to them, well, look, you know, guys, we need to, we need to all, t- all get together and make this work. And, and that sort of uh, integrative teamwork uh, I like, uh, which comes from the sort of uh, coding um, culture as well, where everyone shares those, their own coding, like you said earlier. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic, that culture. If a coder comes up with a, a, a beautiful functionality with his syntax, he posts it onto a platform called, called BitHub, and uh, it's there free of charge to download for your own use. Whereas us architects, we come up with an amazing detail and we want to hide it and we don't want to tell anyone, you know. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm more in favor of that IT culture and, and really helping each other. And I think in, in the end, um, we probably are going to all uh, link, link together into one single cloud system where we're all helping each other probably. <laughs> but um, it is, it's definitely a case where we, we, have to, we have to narrow the gap as fast as possible between software architecture and, and real, real buildings because if we don't catch up, we're going to get more and more left behind uh, in a profession that in, in a lot of ways might just still be traditional. Mm. Uh, anything wrong with that? I've, uh, I'm, uh, I'm amazed how much prestige um, people give uh, the status of what an architect is or was, but I think we really need to push it into the 22nd century by doing this. Mm. Fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit more about, um, about Sky Boardroom and how, how that's, been unfolding and some of the successes and some of the obstacles that you faced with that yeah thank you for mentioning Uh, that's uh, sky boardroom is a platform that i've uh, been wanting to get off the ground for i think nearly about three and a half years now um i've been a very big fan of brian chesky and joe gebbia um they were uh, the guys who originally rented um their room out with a blow-up mattress um, and, then, and then turned it into an Airbnb, uh, and and so the and the rest is history, as you know. Um, but I, in in my struggles, my early years as um, as an architect, I looked into multiple sources of, sources of income, and I was um, I did have a fortunate experience of working with Mark Hitton at uh, Regis in the very early days when they were um, building their portfolio buildings in Eastern Europe and and uh, Southwest England. And uh, I got to um, experience serviced office space. Um, as a result of that, during the times where I had um, started my own firm back in 2009, I opened a service office company myself. 
Um, and it made uh, it made a, 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 a really good uh, sum of money, um, especially from the entre entre entrepreneurial spirit of South Africans. Um, but I did also learn um, that it was again a traditional model, and we were at the beck and call of a very uh, powerful landlord um, mm -hmm. who took a lot of the the rental, um, and we had very high, high overheads, and and we we sort of flattered between 40 to 60 percent occupancy, and it wasn't necessarily as profitable as say I imagined that it could have right. been. And uh, because of my fascination of Airbnb uh, and my awareness of how well the service office space worked, especially in terms of its boardroom rental, I put the two and two together and decided to start Air Boardroom. Now, um, I went fair, uh, a fair, fair way down the line in instigating Air Boardroom and uh, of course Airbnb noise said, look, yeah, they, they found out and gave me a ring and said, look, you can't really use that name. And I said, good point. <laughs> Um, probably shouldn't, and and we we don't rent air mattresses in our boardrooms either. So um, we'll just put it. We'll we'll just call it Sky Boardroom, um, and the Sky Boardroom was uh, was an exciting name as well because it obviously connects all the all the boardrooms of the world, um, and mm -hmm. the, the whole booking system is is on a um, cloud. So the during the latter stages of that company I created called Flexible Workspace in, in Ward Street in, in Johannesburg. Um, I basically questioned on to how much money we made around the boardroom rental, but that was only within 50 offices around it. And I, I realized, okay, well, what, what, happen, what would, what would uh, be the result if I integrated um, smartphones into our um, office space and, and looked at a bigger picture? Um, there were a lot of people walking around our building. We were in the midst of, in the middle of Santon, which is like, um, probably bank in, in London, um, a very uh, corporate, uh, lively area of office buildings. People were going to coffee shops and, and walking around on foot nearby. And I was aware of the fact that if I put that boardroom on my smartphone and used it in a similar fashion uh, as Airbnb, where I can throw out the fact that we've got a boardroom available to rent and uh, it'll pop up on, on someone's GPS on their smartphone and they'll realize, oh, hey, you can use the um, flexible workspace boardroom down the road um, because you're only 565 meters away. You know, then therein was the opportunity. Yeah. And I basically yeah. concluded that uh, I had to take advantage of the gig economy. And and those were the early days of, of my integration into technology um, by using a, a web app, how to integrate um, that business opportunity with the space that I had in the building. And those were the sort of beginnings of, of how I was starting to integrate the, the software architecture of our smartphone onto the spatial management of some of the buildings. And we, we, we yet, let yet to launch, um, but uh, as you can imagine, COVID-19 threw quite a curveball. So I'll, um, we've placed it on hold, but uh, I certainly believe that there's tremendous opportunity for Sky Boardroom. I ultimately want to provide the opportunity for people to take their boardrooms now and, mm -hmm. and upload onto my app because they can generate a revenue. Um, so often I've seen in commercial office buildings that boardrooms sit empty 80% of the time and are there for if the CEO wants to have a quick meeting. Okay, some companies use them a lot, I understand, but from what I've seen for a lot of buildings in South Africa, it's largely underutilized and there is such a prolific amount of people in South Africa, especially, and, and, and around the world, as I've seen with WeWork, when they started coming onto the scene, that people are entre entrepreneurial in fashion and like to work themselves, and they would rather rent a space on a short-term basis. Yeah. So this technology, or I call it space, space management or booking management system, um, is, is an incentive to um, help everyone help each other. Um, so we're helping landlords generate an income and helping um, mobile entrepreneurs they have a space to be able to do that exciting presentation. I mean, um, another um, location that I've been experienced uh, in using is Workshop 17 in Santon and also in the VNA waterfront in Cape Town. And they're almost like a Google um, Google office space style fit out. Um, very exciting space. You know, you can go there, um, jump on a bean bag and open your laptop and there's the punch bag you can have a go and there's a beautiful shop right in the middle of the office space very exciting spaces to use and I could see how that WeWork uh, concept was starting to really um, 
uh, grow at an exponential rate in in uh, the entrepreneurial fashion uh, nowadays as well. But I think they've hit they've hit an interesting curveball with COVID nineteen. Uh, it's not to say that it will die off, but I think it just makes it a little bit more challenging. And I think all the more reason for Scar Boardroom to operate because mm. we'll obviously be promoting COVID nineteen compliant boardroom meeting room spaces. Um, so. In a, in a nutshell, um, uh, quite quite an exciting platform as well, which is also part of my business, um, but on a slightly, slightly different uh, skill set, not under the architectural umbrella, but more on the software space management. And we, we hope to launch that, um, uh, if, if not before the end of the year, certainly the beginning of 2021. Amazing. Uh, what I love as well, when th- these the, the world of architecture and the world of software begin to collide, if you like, is that for me, I've always looked at the software industry as well as, as having a real strong entrepreneurial culture to it, where, yeah. where you're able to identify a problem in an industry or in a business or for people, and you can solve it with a piece of software. And Merging it's, amazing, isn't it? it's, it's brilliant and you know and this can be either in terms of a product a final complete product or in terms of a service so you know you as a service provider can use software in-house to help solve someone's solution or you can have it as a complete standalone product which you then sell and scale and have people use and to bring that culture into brilliant. architecture is is you know the the the, the potential is is infinite essentially there's all sorts Absolutely. of things that we can be doing Almost universal, shooting for the stars. Is there's absolutely no way um, uh, that we could uh, find any end towards the horizon on that. Uh, it's very, very exciting. Um, from soft, as you say, products to software as a service and software as a as a platform. It's uh, the opportunities are endless, and and we can do it anywhere in the world, wherever you are, from a beach in Tahiti to to the middle of Johannesburg uh, or in Cape Town or anywhere yeah. in America. It's, it's quite, uh, you can work remotely on, on all these opportunities. It's not like in the old days where architects had to be local. Yeah. Well, we, we just, uh, we're expanding us, our, our skill set in a direction that, that probably is um, quite obvious um, to go. It, all, it also opens up the opportunity for other industries or people with software experience and design experience in, in maybe not in not in buildings but rather complex systems like like programs and software um, to move into the domain of the built environment yes yes uh, I, I think it's they're gonna there are uh, other industries that they are going to be plugging into this spectrum as well like uh, 3d printing um, obviously some of the buildings are going to be um, made by machines I even um, found out yesterday that there are brick layers that are being performed by drones you know those flying drones yeah never seen anything like it but you've got uh, you know that sort of four propeller drone carrying bricks and these uh, four or five drones are building a brick wall at the same time. I mean that we're already seeing now, um, which is fascinating. I think they're going to ha- they, they are definitely going to be looking into it um, with a view towards uh, how they'll perform it in Mar- on Mars. Um, by the time look, uh, Elon Musk is is well on his way. Um, you know he's doing incredibly well um, from since he started what fifteen years ago um, till now. Um, he's going to no doubt get to Mars and they have been looking at uh, different techniques of, of construction uh, on, on the surface of Mars. And I think, you know, these, all these integrative uh, areas that we're talking about from software platforms to 3D printing um, are what's going to be utilized when they get there. I mean, I know that Bjork Engels has looked at very, some very exciting um, uh, possibilities of uh, designed buildings on the surface of Mars with the 3D printing. So they're, they're, these all, all all come together. I, I understand that um, that they did 3D print um, the the two astronauts' mo- uh, helmets um, when they went up to the International Space Station about eight or nine weeks ago, mm. and that was completely done. And and those you know those were um, robotic Python program related, no doubt. I don't know for sure. Don't quote me, but I, very likely it was a Python program with uh, the robotic control. And uh, those were directly linked to designers. 
Um, and, you know, designer is not going to, the, the, the person who designed those helmets was very likely um, completely aware of coding software used to control a laser uh, manufacturing yeah. and, uh, and 3D printing. So it's, it, it, you can see how it needs to all merge together. Um, yeah. And the sooner we all learn to do it, the better. Mm. No, it's, you know, I used, to, I used to think that designing a building was enough. <laughs> it, that's almost you got to know how to do it as a given. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's fascinating as well because now, now you're now we're talking about here that the sort of the, the architect or the designer being even more closer to the to the process of production, right? So you know, yes. we're, we're we're actually now controlling the machines or the tools that are actually printing and physically making what it is that we've come up with as an idea and, and again that's a very interesting situation which is kind of quite new that puts the, the the potential there for designers to be to be kind of the head of the process or you know very much intimately involved with the entire fabrication of something is is very interesting and again all sorts of uh, business opportunities and entrepreneur entrepreneurial opportunities uh, absolutely and and just to give you an example of that and where i think the integration is not quite 100 percent there yet is the those um there's been a company in uh, dubai where they have created a a building out of 3d uh, 3d printing but there was there it wasn't quite 100 percent 3d printed because they literally dug and poured the foundations um, and poured the surface bed, but then they 3D printed the walls, and then once that was finished, they had to come and recast it. So there was this integration of very traditional construction techniques and 3D mm -hmm. printing. It wasn't 100% printing, and I think uh, uh, one of the ways to resolve that is to literally work out how you can get a, um, a 3D printing to follow to follow suit from from foundation foundation all the way to roof um, without the integration of the two and and in order to do that, there's going to have to be a very, um, a very inherent involvement of, of coding software to teach the machine how to do that, um, to get to that kind of solution. Brilliant. Nick, thank you so much. I think that's a, a really great place to conclude the conversation there, but it's really exciting and very inspiring to hear about your, your, your research, your, your, parts of your business that you've expanded and how you're beginning to merge software artificial intelligence with the traditional role of an architect it's really exciting so thank you very much thanks for that uh, Rion um, and you know, thanks for the opportunity to express it uh, certainly very exciting to share um, our, our journey and our process and direction we're going um, and uh, yeah pleasure for you to show such enjoyment in it as well thank you Brilliant. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.